Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris. I am an alcoholic. I do not believe Dave did it. <laughs> we were coming up with topics, and one, you know, one of them was spirituality as a character defect. You know, and having a lot of fun this morning, and I had no idea that he would actually put that into the uh, preamble. Anyway, it's really good to be here uh, today. Uh, I want to thank uh, Robbie and, and Dave for putting this on. Uh, it's always fun to do these things. It's always fun to, to gather together in fellowship. Uh, you know, in each time, remind each other how important uh, spiritual growth is, how important, you know, it is for us to stick together and continue to encourage each other uh, as we move forward on uh, the path toward uh, toward recovery. Uh, you know, one of the things about alcoholism is it's a very, very unorthodox illness. Um, the book Alcoholics Anonymous talks about alcoholism as being an illness. Uh, in the mid-50s, the American uh, uh, Medical Society Association uh, came came to the conclusion that uh, alcoholism is a disease. You know, I'm not going to get involved in that argument, but I can certainly understand that it is definitely an illness. And, and it's an unorthodox illness in the way that it presents. And it's misunderstood by people who have it. It's misunderstood by 90% of the people out there that will treat you for it. It's certainly misunderstood by most of the people who come in contact with us. Uh, it is seen as uh, it is seen as a kind of a self. Uh, perpetuating disorder uh, that we're playing uh, a willing part in. And I don't know about anybody else, but the last two or three years of my drinking, I was absolutely desperate to separate from alcohol. I, you know, I, I, I wasn't stupid. I saw, that, I saw that my drinking was going to kill me probably pretty soon, and it was also tarnishing every piece of quality that my life had. My personal relationships were in the toilet. My, you know, my ability to show up when I needed to show up was impacted. I was, uh, you know, I was an absolute mess. And, you know, I knew that there was something really wrong with me being as big of a mess as I was. But I was caught up in this. You know, alcoholism is incredibly aggressive as an illness. It is, if you suffer from alcoholism, if you're an alcoholic in here today, I, there's one thing I absolutely know, and that is you're minimizing. Because, you know, I'm minimizing. We all minimize as far as just how aggressive alcoholism is and just how much attention we need to pay to it. Because it is the rapacious creditor uh, that it talks about in our book. I have so, I've seen so many people's lives just wiped out by Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been in home groups where we buried at least a person a year. You know, and these are, these are young people who had a lot going for them. You know, a lot of times, you know, a lot of times we're, you know, we're intelligent people. We, you know, we have, uh, uh, we have a lot of, a lot of potential. Anybody ever tell you you had a lot of potential? They were telling me that until they finally realized they were probably wrong. Uh, but, uh, uh, but anyway, alcoholism is uh, just, you know, just brutal and very, very unorthodox. Um, you know, some of the ways, uh, some of the ways that it works is obviously, you know, the right up front in your face issue is that if you're an alcoholic, you have little or no control over the amount you take when you start drinking. Harder to understand, though, really, is the obsession of the mind. Why do we keep going back to drinking? You know, how many times have we said, this time, I really mean it. I'm not going to drink again, and yet we, we drink. Uh, but really, the worst part, I think, of, of alcoholism is what it does to our spirit, what it does to the damage it does to our emotional uh, condition. And how it uh, how it just levels us uh, and levels our quality of life. Now, uh, I started drinking in you know the the very early seven. Well, actually, the late sixties. Uh, I ended up um, uh, taking uh, the last drink that I've had it, it so far in late nineteen eighty nine. And during that period of time, it was about a twenty year period of time. And in the beginning. 
I found alcohol to be incredibly wonderful. As a, as a child growing up and going through school and, you know, being an adolescent and everything, I, I, I had a difficult time dealing. I had a difficult time with a lot of situations in my life. Um, I, you know, there wasn't the, the heightened sense of psychological disorder uh, type of placements that we have today. Today, you can you can get you know uh, you, you can get labeled or you can get diagnosed with so many different kind of things. But as a child, I probably could have been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder or personality disorders, uh, uh, you know, depression, uh, a sense of you know not feeling a part of, being really separated from uh, from my world and living so much in my head. And and you know this caused me uh, a lot of and, you know, anxiety, you know, as a, as a child going through school, there were things that I was unbelievably afraid of, you know, I mean, things that I just, you know, I was terror stricken and it seemed like all the other kids were fine with this, you know, I'll give you just one example of it. I think, I think I'm about 10 years old or something. And does anybody in here remember square dancing in school? <laughs> like, oh my God, they, they have no idea what they're doing to the pre-alcoholic by putting you in a situation like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> what they did in my school is they, they, they lined up all the girls on one side of the gymnasium and all the boys on the other side, they blew the whistle and you had to run across the gymnasium and ask a girl to dance. Are you kidding me? What idiot came up with this as a form of physical exercise? Are you nuts? You know, and I'm 10 years old, and I'm, you know, I'm running across, I'm about to die, you know, and I'm running across and trying to find a girl to dance with. I mean, now everybody else is having a good time, you know, but me, I'm like free. And you know, I, I, I got to tell you, the, the solution, I came across the solution when I first took a, a drink of alcohol. Um, it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a day, I think I was in eighth grade or something, and I decided with a couple of my friends that we were going to cut school and go back to my house and get drunk. And it was like, you know, a real, real cool thing to do. We could tell a lot of stories the next day of school about it. And we did. We went back to my house, and I pulled out from, from the closet, I pulled out a dusty bottle of Four Roses whiskey, okay? And I poured three big water glasses filled with that whiskey, and I handed it to my two buddies, and I, you know, I took one, and we all started drinking. And what happened with my buddies was probably what happens to normal people. They had two-thirds of their glass, and man, they had had enough. You ever drink with people who have enough on you? <laughs> you know, my God, what do you mean you had enough? Are you crazy? It's only 11 o'clock. Let's go to the city! You know? Are you nuts? And because that's how I drank. Anyway, I, you know, they started drinking. They had two thirds of the glass and they sat back and they watched the show. Because I had all my glass, the rest of their glasses finished off the bottle. And I went into my first blackout. You know, which is uh, any blackout drinkers in here? Oh, oh, man. That can be disconcerting, can it? Yeah. You know, coming to in different cities with like one shoe, you know, and oh man. You know, there was some, I, in blackouts, I would do horrific things and people would remind me, you know, you know what you did last night? It got to the point, I don't, don't tell me. I don't want to know what I did last night. Please, you know, please be merciful and just don't tell me. And I would do things like I'd call my boss up, you know, in a blackout and threaten his life, I'm going to kill you. And I, I wouldn't remember, so I'd go walking into work the next day, da, 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 you know, he'd be like, what the hell are you doing here? I'm like, what? You know? Uh, it's just awful, awful. But the thing that happened to me when I started drinking that Four Roses whiskey was that terrified school kid, you know? The person who's, a, who's just freaked about running across the gymnasium to ask a girl to dance. When I started drinking that alcohol, it took that fear away. It took away that anxiety. That it talks about it in the in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, the bondage of self, the bondage of self, being so locked up inside of me that I'm so I'm self centered. Everything revolves and, and impacts me, you know. And uh, to to live like that is just tremendously difficult. And when I found a way out, I found 
alcohol, which I believed allowed me to be normal. You know, and I understood that going into a blackout and then being unbelievably sick for three days was not probably a good thing. But from that moment forward, from recognizing what alcohol did for me, it, it made me feel larger than life. It made me feel like everything is okay. You know, this is so cool being here with these guys. You know, I never felt, I always wanted to be somewhere else. So, you know, I experienced this alcohol, and from that moment forward, I become obsessed with it. I become obsessed with where I was going to drink, who, who I was going to drink with, how I was going to get it. You know, because I was like, I was like 13, and the drinking age was 21. You know, so I was problematic. You know, got to work those things out. You know, and and I started, I started to arrange my life really without even conscious awareness of this. I started to arrange my life to fit alcohol in, because alcohol needed to come in. I mean, I, you know. For the longest time, people were telling me my drinking was a problem, and I would not understand what they were saying. They got, they were getting it wrong. I'll give you, I'll give you a for instance. I drove through a telephone pole after I passed out, you know, drunk out of my mind, and I was killed. Okay, I was killed when the when the cops got there. There was no pulse. There was no breathing. They had to give me CPR. And I went flatline again in the ambulance, and they had to hit me with the paddles. You know, clear, boom. You know, and they had to bring me back. And I remember coming to in the emergency room, and they're sewing my head shut, and I'm yelling and puking, and the, the doctor's pissed, and everything's it's just it's just horrible, horrible. See, my ribs are broken now. You know, the normal person would say, man, this was a bad experience. I need to avoid this, okay? But you know what I did? As soon as I was out of the hospital, my first my first thing that I did was go to the liquor store, get some booze, and drive down to the park where we would drink. So I was drinking and driving again with, you know, still bleeding from being killed. It wasn't like, you know, I was not saying that it's the alcohol that's the problem. The alcohol was way too part of my world for me to recognize alcohol as a problem. My problem was me. My problem was sobriety. Sobriety was untenable for me. I did not like it. I needed something to take me away, to take the edge off. To, to get me out of myself because it was not a good place to be inside me. So what happened was after becoming preoccupied, uh, obsessed with this alcohol, somewhere along the line we cross a line. And we cross a line into alcoholism. We cross a line into powerlessness. And once you cross that line, you are not going back you know, with, with, with human aid. You, it, it is a much too serious issue to be able to just decide to stop drinking. That's why so many of us stop. Because wanting to not drink doesn't mean anything after you've crossed that line. You can want to stay away from alcohol as, as, as hard as you can possibly want to stay away from alcohol, and you don't. So, you know, I'm drinking, I'm drinking just tons and tons of alcohol. Everybody's like, oh my God, you know, I can't believe how loaded you got. You know, and dr drugs were around. There's a whole lot of drugs uh, back in the, the very early 70s. And, you know, I partook of those too. You know what I mean? I used those alcoholically. I, rem I remember the great Quaalude epidemic of 73. Okay. This buddy of mine comes in with a big set. If anybody, if anybody in here has, is inexperienced with Quaaludes, taking a Quaalude is like drinking a six pack of beer in a minute and a half. That's about what, okay, so, you know, try to picture this. This guy brings in a, a giant sack of Quaaludes and his brother had given them to him the night before and said, sell these tomorrow in school. He hadn't done them either. So he's selling them for a dollar in the smoking area before school, high school. And uh, so we're like, well, how many do you take, man? And he's like, ah, three or four. <laughs> so about 50 of us took three or four playlists before first period. That was a mess. There were ambulances coming in and out, you know. 
I, I remember I made it to about fourth period, and I was walking down the hall, like hanging on the lockers like this. I, I figured, I gotta get out of here, you know? So I see an exit sign, you know? I was always great at exiting places. So I exit sign, so I blow out that exit door, and I head for the woods. And I'm running, I just, I was running. And I get out to the woods, and, you know, I find all these people, like, hugging trees out there. I, I wasn't, like, the only guy that thought it was. <laughs> now, the next day in school, they, they come on to me, and they go, oh, Chris, man, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. You know, everybody in the 300 wing watched you bolt to the woods. You know, they, they go, it took you, took you five minutes to do 100 yards, you know? It was like, I was like, <laughs> God. You know, and, and I was looking for those quaaludes to do again, you know, for, for you know, oh, I just, I just, I needed out of me, you know what I mean? I needed something to change my world because my world was so uncomfortable all the time. Now, you do 20 years of this, and what's happened is you, you, you have become alcoholic. You become a chronic alcoholic. The big book describes somebody like me as a hopeless alcoholic, a real alcoholic. Somebody, you know, not a disco drunk, you know, somebody that drinks a little bit and gets in trouble, but somebody who is totally, totally addicted and dependent on alcohol. And it didn't matter what I wanted. I was going to have a certain amount of alcohol in my in my system toward the end every single day, or the, or there was going to be hell to pay emotionally and physically for me. Now, I finally I finally get to a point where it's it's time to get sober. I mean, I, I just have to. I had been in an outpatient to get a get a uh, my license back. I had like three DUIs. I had to get my license back, so I went to this outpatient, and I knew that you know if you're in real trouble, you know you can sign yourself in upstairs on the fifth and sixth floor. So that's what I did. I called them up. I said, I'm coming in. Uh, and, uh, and I went in. And I started, uh, I started 28 days in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, primary treatment for alcoholism. It was, a, it was a place in Morristown, New Jersey. Now, i got to tell you, remember I said that alcoholism is misunderstood? The whole protocol for treatment was based on something that I wasn't. It was alcohol and drug treatment, but it was for it, it, the only people that succeeded with this type, this type of, uh, of, of uh, treatment methodology were the heavy drinkers or the occasional, you know, like drug abusers. People like me who had become dependent and addicted to alcohol, th this was like trying to stop a semi with a cobweb, this 28-day this treatment program. I remember they would do things like put, put you in group. Anybody in here ever been in group? You know, in 28 days, right? And you sit around a circle and you talk about, like, what's going on in your day, you know, and, oh, God, it was bad. You know, I remember this one day in group, I'm sitting there, and there's this, this one guy would always share, he'd always take up the time, and I'd be pissed, you know, would you just shut up? Would you just shut up? Nobody cares, I'm thinking, what do you, what do you think? You know, why don't you just go drink? You know, get the hell out of here. You know, I want to share you know, and, uh, and it, it came time for me to share, and I just like vomited up, you know, like, just share, 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 share. And, this, and this counselor stopped me. Now, this counselor w would, would introduce herself as an adult child of an alcoholic, okay? Now, I didn't know any of the recovery, you know, terminology. I didn't, I didn't know the protocols. I'd never been exposed to any of this stuff. Today, today I have a lot of respect for, for ACOA and, and, the, and the other, the other uh, organizations that, that help people, uh, you know, who've been impacted by people like me, you know. I'm all, I'm all for those, those, uh, those, those groups. Thank God that they're there. But, but I'm like, and no child of an alcoholic, and then she would start talking to this counselor. I'm like, well, I, you know, I'm an, al I'm, I'm an insane alcoholic from a librarian, you know, but, but I don't say that before I start talking every time. What the hell is wrong with this woman? And she's, she's, a, she's a counselor, okay? And, you know, I'm, I'm sharing, sharing, and, and, and she stops and She goes, Chris, Chris, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Let me ask you something. Tell me, how do you feel? Are you happy, mad, sad, or glad? I'm like, what? Are you crazy? I'm like, psychotic, and I want to kill you. You know? Now, why would you ever ask an alcoholic something like that? You know? Well, because, because I'm on the spin dry cycle in the 28th day. 
game. I mean, you take every single emotion that you have and put it in a blender and punch 10. And you've been getting close to like what I was feeling. Like, I couldn't separate my, you know, whether I'm happy, sad, man. I, I want to get out of here. I want to kill you. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and now, now, so what the hell does that have to do with treating alcoholism, something like that? You know what I mean? That, that, that's going to a gunfight with a pen knife sitting in group. You know, so I, so I, did, the, I did the 28 days. I went to outpatient uh, because they told me to go to outpatient. And I started to go to AA meetings on a regular basis. And I, but I didn't understand any of this stuff. I mean, how many people that walk into AA go, oh, the, the steps, oh, the traditions, oh, I get it, I'm in. I mean, how many people do that? You know, I walked in going, what the hell is going on? And, I, you know, I was, go, I was going to the closed-minded discussion meetings of the, the late 80s, you know, where people would share, like they would in group, you know, about their day. You know, like, I remember this one woman sharing this. She shared, she said, you know, I've got a real problem. I've got a lot on my plate. I, you know, I bought a new house and I was expecting to sell my other house and my other house isn't selling. So I'm stuck with two houses. I'm like, how the hell do you get a house? I get like two dollars. What are you talking about? You know, I'm not like these people. I'm not like these people, you know. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this isn't going to work for me. These people are crazy. They have houses. You know what I mean? Oh, my God. And, it, you know, so so I thought, I thought this just can't possibly work. This AA stuff can't possibly work. But I'm going because I'm desperate. Alcohol is is kicking my ass. I am so desperate that I'm going to listen to, to Mary Two House, you know, every Tuesday night. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, going meetings, going to outpatient. Guess what they had in outpatient that I paid $65 a night for? <laughs> you know, so I'm going to that. And, you know, this is, this is all, I gotta tell you, this is all wrong, you know? This is way wrong. I'm, th- you know, I can't buy into it because I can't understand it. How does listening to morons talk about their day, how does that help me? You know, how does, how is that going to keep me from drinking? I didn't understand. It. So I was, I was halfway in. I was halfway in. I didn't get a sponsor because I, I just couldn't understand going up to somebody and saying, hey, you know, you're, you seem to be doing okay with your life and my life's in the goddamn toilet. You know, I, I mean, I'm still living at home with mom, and, you know, I've got a $6 an hour job, and, you know, and I'm wearing the clothes I had in high school. I figured by calling you up every day for about an hour and dragging you down into the hell of my life, I'll feel a little bit better. You know, how, you free? You know, I mean, I, I, I couldn't do that to somebody, you know? So, so. So I didn't get a sponsor. Get a home group. You know, it so happened that the groups I was I was going to were just a little autonomous, little closed-minded discussion meetings. They, they weren't home groups. You know, so I'm like, well, the groups I'm going to aren't home groups. So every 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 suggestion that has been developed to hold you in to the fellowship long enough to discover recovery. Every single one of those suggestions I bypassed because I figured out why it wouldn't work for me. Now. You gotta understand, I am, I am desperate to stay away from alcohol. I'm absolutely desperate to stay away from alcohol. I, 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 I can't continue to drink. It is going to take me out. It's gonna happen soon. So, uh, so I can, I'm continuing to go. And if you would have, if you would have polled anybody in any of these groups and asked them, you know, how much do you really want to stay away from alcohol? I would have won. I guarantee I was the person in that room who wanted to stay away from booze more than anybody else because I, I was I was desperate at that point. And I was shaking and shattered. My eyes were still yellow from liver failure, you know. And what happened was one day I was on the way to an AA meeting, and the thought crossed my mind that you know it's been a while since so I, I I haven't been drunk in like probably eighty days or so, almost three months. And you know it doesn't feel like I'm really doing a good job in AA. I'll bet you. If I buy a gallon of vodka and I drink it, it'll make me, it'll reinvigorate my commitment to this whole recovery thing. So, 
That's what I did. I bought a gallon of vodka to improve my sobriety. And I started drinking it. And here I am, I'm drinking, gla- drink, drink one glass, oops, good idea, good idea, second glass, good idea, third glass. Oh my God, what have I done? You know, that thought came on me because all of a sudden I could feel the alcohol going through me. And I knew, I knew that I'd opened up the cage door to the beast. And it was just going to be a matter of time before it drags me through hell again. And that's exactly what happened. So what happened was, think think about this for a minute. Where was I insane? Did the alcohol make me insane? I was insane before the drink. I've never taken the first drink drunk in my life. The insanity happens when I'm sober. And that event, which lasted about six or seven months, which was just horrible. It was a it was the worst period of time in my life. I can't even tell you how bleak and decadent and, and, and terror-stricken and lonely those seven months were. When the smoke cleared from that and I, I struggled my way back to Alcoholics Anonymous, I understood experientially what the obsession of the mind looks like. I can be the person in the room that wants to stay away from alcohol the most. And alcohol doesn't care what I think. Alcohol wants to go back in my body. And powerlessness is powerlessness. If there's something you can do to stay away from alcohol, you on your own unaided will, then how can you say you're powerless? Just do that. If you can do it, just do it. And I was going to meetings. I was going to outpatient. You know, I was telling everybody I was I was sober for good. I quit drinking for good. And what happened was I ended up drunk. And the way alcohol tricked me into it was by convincing me it would improve my sobriety. You know, uh, alcohol doesn't care how it gets back into your body. So when when the smoke cleared from that and I came back into the rooms, uh, I was desperate. I, I had a willingness that was born in desperation. I still didn't think this crap would work, this AA stuff with, 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 with all these losers in the church basement, you know, talking about their day. But I had no other plans, and I didn't want to die. I had a young daughter at that time, and I did not want to go out in disgrace. You know, alcoholics, when they go out, they usually go out in disgrace. And I just didn't, I just didn't want that to be, to be my, my life story. You know, Chris drinks himself to death in disgrace. So I had a willingness and I went back in and this time, this time I got a sponsor. On, on day two back in the rooms, uh, I went up to this guy, Fish Food Phil. And I said, Phil, you know, I've been in hell. I want to get out. You know, help me. And, and he did. And this is, this is back in uh, January of 1990, okay? Now, I don't know what AA is like in this area, but in, in the area that I was going for, my, say, my first five years uh, in AA, there was fellowship. And Alcoholics Anonymous was basically fellowship. That's what it was about. And if you had a really good sponsor, that sponsor would get you involved in service. So it was fellowship, and if you had a good sponsor, there'd be some service. And I got a good sponsor, and he, he had a service ethic, in, and he trained me to have a service service, service ethic. I, I, and, you know, things he asked me to do that I didn't want to do, I did them anyway. You know, I did not want to help you out. You know, I have my own problems, you know. You want me to go help somebody? Are you kidding me? But I, but I would do it. And uh, uh, so I believe that going to at least a meeting a day, and doing these service commitments kept me sober, offered me uh, a little bit of the grace, the grace period that we get. E- each of us have grace periods when we get sober. Some of them are short, some of them are long. But it offered me that grace period to stay sober long enough to discover recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, here's, here's basically my story. Remember, I'm like, I'm like freaked out. You would ask me, Chris, how you doing? And I'd give the regular AA, oh, I'm doing great, you know, wonderful, thank you, you know, doing really good. When, he, you know, inside I'm thinking, you, you, you moronic hypocrite, I, you know, you shared a bunch of crap, and you know, you, you're a great flop, I'll show you a great flop, I'll, I'll cut all four of your tires in the parking lot, and after you share about gratitude, I'll get to see it in action, you know what I mean? I mean, you, 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 you lame brain moron, what are you even doing talking? I'm doing great, you know. So that's what I'm thinking. And I mean, I'm I'm doing, I'm 
showing up at meetings and I'm doing the service commitments, but I am still unbelievably emotionally sick. Everything is still very, very difficult for me. Complete lack of dealage. You know what I mean? I couldn't, I couldn't take anything. Uh, I would, I would wake up in the morning, you know, uh, brush my hair, drive to work, get, get away from work, come home and sleep until the meeting. And then I'd go to the meeting and maybe go out to the diner and then go back home and sleep. I mean, there was very, very little I could really do. I was so ill. You know, I, I just couldn't, I, I just couldn't deal. And, uh, along the way, along the way, this, uh, this guy who I became friends with, get this, my first friend in AA, this is how, this is how it happened. He comes up to me in a meeting and nobody was talking to me back in these days. I mean, you know, I was like, I was like that garage door spring with like 2,000 pounds of tension in it and you're, you're afraid to stand near it because it'll snap and hurt you. You know, that's what I was like. So people, people kept clear of it. And this one guy was just crazy enough to come up to me and, and he starts talking to me and he starts going, you know, oh, you know, I'm really worried. You know, I live in a house with three other guys and one of the guys just beat the crap out of the other guy. I'm really scared to go home, you know. And I, I go, oh, you're scared to go home? Well, I'll, I'll give you a hand, okay? Let's just stop at my house. So so he drives over, you know, I'll go into your house with you to make sure everything's fine. So, okay, we go to my house. I get I get this gigantic hunting knife about this long, right? I put it, put it in my pocket. I go, okay, let's, let's go over. Let's, let's, let's go see what's going on at your house. I mean, this is how I became friends with my first friend. I was willing to, like, open somebody up for this, for, for my new buddy, Radio Shack Mike, you know, and uh, just out of my life. Now, 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 Mike, a, a couple months later, you know, we still we were going to meetings together, and he was one of these guys that would go to the New Age bookstores a lot, you know, he'd, he'd go buy, like, healing through pyramids, you know, and, and one day, he'd be like, pyramids, Chris, pyramids, you know, and the next day, it would be like some Louise Hay affirmations, you know, he even had me do affirmations once, stand in front of the mirror and say, like, 50 times until you believe it, Chris, you're a wonderful guy, so I'm like, Chris, you're a wonderful guy, Chris, you're a wonderful guy, <laughs> Slants, you know, this is crap, you know, it's a, like affirmations, you know, I'm still an untreated alcoholic, for God's sake, affirmations, so, so he had all this crap, and this, and this one day, he brings me this stack of tapes, they're like eight 90 minute tapes of guys from Arkansas doing a big book study, I'm like, Arkansas? <laughs> what the hell is anybody from Arkansas going to be able to teach me? We get more thinking done by 9 o'clock than an Arkansasian would get done all day. <laughs> and I bet you they talk really slow, like this, off the speed of the tape book. You know, this is crazy. But I had a long drive to work, so I took them, you know, and I put these tapes in, I put these tapes in. Let me tell you what somebody could, from Arkansas could teach me. I had missed one third, the most important third of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had missed completely the recovery part of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was going to meetings, and meetings, there's, there's promises that you'll get from going to meetings. And I was doing service commitments, and there's promises that you'll get from services commitments. They're unfortunately not the promises that promise that you'll stay sober, but they're promises. And I start listening to these Joe and Charlie tapes, and they start talking about a program of recovery based on the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And my immediate, my immediate reaction to this was to get pissed. Like, who are these guys from Arkansas talking this crap about it? This is how, isn't how we do it in, in the Burnsville Acorn group. You know? What are they talking about? If this stuff was true, why, why, why hasn't my sponsor been telling me about this? You know? But I got all the way through these, these eight tapes. It's like 12 hours worth of, you know, big book study. And I was still resentful, you know. Here's what will happen if you're new or just coming back. When somebody hits you with the truth, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to get pissed. But if you're lucky, you'll have, you'll have to somehow deal with that truth. You'll have to internalize it and come to terms with that truth. You'll have to. And that's basically what happened to me. Now, the next thing that happened was I, I you know, I met, uh, I met a girl in NAA. Okay. I had, I like 14 months sober and I, I met, you know, God's will for me. And, uh, oh my God. You know, my sponsor really tried to talk me out of this, you know. Uh, he said, Chris, two dinglings don't make a bell. You know, and, and, uh, and he, he really 
finally said, Chris, the, the chances of you running off into the sunset happily ever after are probably a million to one. And I'm looking at him like he's crazy. This is a woman, you know? And, uh, and it didn't work out because two people have to feel the same way, usually in relationships, for it to stay together. And, uh, and I, you know, I was heartbroken and, you know, I'd lost a job about three or four Three or four perfect storm, emotional storm-like events happen. And, you know, we'll, we will go through these, these sober trials and tribulations. And it talks about it in the big book. That we'll get through them if our spiritual house is in order. But if it's not, they're going to take us out. The time and the place will come and we will be taken out by these events in our life. And I was, I was really, really close to saying, screw this and screw these morons and, you know, going to the liquor store. I was very, very close. But what I did instead was I looked over and I looked at those tapes and I said, maybe, maybe what these guys were talking about is true because it had been haunting me. You know, the, the information on these tapes had been haunting me for. So I broke out the tapes. I opened up a big book, dusted it off because it was a big book that I got in treatment. You know, you know how you sign people's books in treatment? I still have mine. It's like, Chris, you're the craziest subject I've ever met. You're never going to make it. Love Harry. You know, I mean, you got you to see, you got to see this, this book. <laughs> so I dust it off, I dust it off, and I open it up, and I get a pad and a pencil, the big book, and I start listening to these tapes. And this is how I did it. When it came to an instruction, I stopped, and I went through that instruction before I moved on. What I was doing is I was kind of taking myself through the steps with these tapes. And... uh what happened was, I didn't know it at the time, and you have to understand, I didn't do this out of a sense of virtue or a sense of being a better AA. I was doing this so I didn't feel so bad anymore. I didn't want to feel bad anymore, you know? And maybe this, maybe this will work. It, it sounded like it would work uh, a little bit because these guys were killer, drop dead alcoholics, Joe and Chuck. So anyway, <clears throat> I start, uh, I start going through this. And I didn't know it at the time, but I started to recover from alcoholism. Make no mistake about it. Sobriety, sobriety, uh, the way I define it, uh, sobriety is the absence of alcohol in one's body. Uh, recovery is knowing a new freedom and a new happiness from that, that anxiety, depression stricken person that Chris was before going through uh, the 12 steps. So I started to recover from alcoholism, and I started to sound better in the AA meetings, you know, because because I, I started to get better, and I, and I learned early on how to give good share, you know. You know how you give good share in a discussion meeting? You know, you try not to say anything that's going to upset anybody or that somebody's going to come back at you after you share and, you know, correct you. You try to talk about yourself and about, you know, those stupid little things that you did today, like, listen to how stupid I was today, ha ha. You know, a little self-deprecating. You know, and if you learn how to give good share like that, you know, people people will respond. And I was getting people to that came up and said, you know, Chris, uh, uh, you know, would you be my sponsor? And my immediate answer was always yes. You know, I'm like, oh my god, yes. And uh, the problem with that was I was passing it on the way my sponsor passed it on to me, which was basically just go to meetings. You know, take 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 a coffee commit. You know, stay sober. And what was happening was a lot of these guys were drinking on me. They were making me look bad. <laughs> you know, somebody would come out and go, is Harry yours? You know, he's drinking and hitting on the women and borrowing money. Yeah, Harry's mine. I'll talk to him. <laughs> now, you know, so, so I came up with this idea. I don't know where it came from. And I remember the first guy I brought over, brought over to my house. I said, you're coming over to my house. And we sat down and I opened up the book Alcoholics Anonymous and we started going through it page by page. And when there was an instruction, I didn't know better. We both would do the instruction. So in the early days of taking people through the steps, I was going through every time with them, you know. And, uh, and, what I learned two two very very important things with this with this exercise. Number one is the guys who would go through the steps with me. Every single one of them stayed sober. Every single one of them recovered from alcoholism. As a matter of fact, every single one of them is still sober today and sponsoring other people. Everybody that made it through and stayed consistent with the re the recovery process. You know the spiritual exercises and uh, uh, spiritual principles in the book. They're all still so. And what I learned that was even more important for me 
was that I started to recover from alcoholism. I started to feel more comfortable with myself and my environment. I started to be okay where I was doing what I was doing. I started to not shoot myself in the foot all the time with my self-centered, self-seeking behavior. And life started to get better. I started to get promoted more. I started to, to get better uh, relationships. I started to get better better friends. Things started looking up in my life, you know. Uh, and I started to learn a little bit experientially about recovery. Now, you know, this is an experiential workshop here. This weekend. I'm really looking, there's some great speakers. I'm really looking forward to, to hearing them today. But make no mistake about it, this is not an intellectual exercise. Many of us today are coming here to learn a little bit more about recovery, about the steps. Learning is not going to get it. This isn't something that you recover from through knowledge. It's something that you're going to only recover from through action. And what happens is if you come to a weekend like this and you're invigorated and you feel inspired, take that power from that inspiration and direct it into a series of actions that involve the 12 steps. Because that's what's going to be transformative in your life. That's what's going to really make a big difference in, in how you move through this world. Listen, I'm at a point today where I am, I am unbelievably grateful for being on this planet, able to interact with people in it, to have this, be a spiritual being, having this human experience that I'm involved with. I can't even tell you how grateful I am for every minute of every day. I used to just want to check out when I was drinking. I wanted out. I love the downers and the booze because you just check out, you know? Uh, every every once in a while, I do the cocaine or the speed, and I, you know, I'd have to drink, on, you know, because that's too much of me. You know, I, I, that's just way too much of me. You know, I, I need I need to I need to check out. So I'm incredibly I'm incredibly grateful. Now, Alcoholics Anonymous, you need to understand some, some things about Alcoholics Anonymous. I've done a lot of history. I have a lot of opinions on this, but these are opinions based on critical historical study. I am not saying that they're right, and if you have an opinion of your own, uh, you're right too. But what my opinion is, is two very negative things happened in Alcoholics Anonymous a number of years ago. One of them was the American Medical Society saying alcoholism is a disease. That made it incumbent upon insurance companies to pay for alcoholism, and that made treatment centers pop up everywhere. You couldn't shake when I got sober. This was before managed care. You couldn't shake a stick without without hit without hitting a, a treatment center somewhere. And I mean, they were everywhere. Any anybody with an idea could open a treatment center and charge insurance companies for it. Some of the crap that they used to do, I can't even tell you how wacky it was. But they they called themselves a treatment center and they and they got reimbursement from insurance companies. So. What happened to all these people that went through these wackadoo treatment centers? Where did they go? Where did they start showing up? They started showing up in Alcoholics Anonymous. And guess what they wanted the meeting to look like in Alcoholics Anonymous? Group. <laughs> and that's where you got all the closed-minded discussion meetings with, you know, with, with, with Mary Two House, you know, coming every week just to share her crap about how much crap she had on her plate, you know? That, so all of a sudden, Alcoholics Anonymous started to get watered down by people that didn't understand recovery. Their experience was, was treatment. Their experience was psychological. Their experience wa was, you know, group therapy and stuff like that. All of a sudden, so now the meetings are changing away from experiential recovery. What happened was Alcoholics Anonymous went from a program of recovery to a fellowship of sobriety. And it happened slowly over the course of years. The old timers dropped the ball. They, you know, I can understand. They probably got really sick of, well, there's a whole new batch of newcomers from Happy Hills at the meeting. Oh, my God, kill me now. You know, they went somewhere else, you know, and, and they let the sick treat the sick in these meetings. You know, so that really watered us down. And that took our eyes, that took our attention off of the true recovery process, which is the 12 steps. Took our, took our eyes off it. You know, when I got sober, nobody was talking about going through the big book and doing the work. If you would have shared something like in a meeting, they, they, they would have told all their newcomers to stay away from you. We have a fanatic, you know, in the meeting. You know, the, the, 
you know, you were supposed to share. You know, that's how you stay sober. Another thing that was very, very detrimental to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I want you to hear me out, you know, before thinking that I'm completely wrong about this, is the publication of the 12 and 12. Now, what happened when the 12 and 12 was published in the early 50s is we had the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. That was our basic text. That's what you would try to base your meetings on if you were going to be a literature-based meeting. But with the publication of the 12 and 12, it made such mathematical sense to read a step and then share on it. You know, you could go through the step book four times or uh, four times in a year or three times in a year, and you know, and you could do the traditions and all this. And what happened was all of a sudden uh, we had a bunch of step meetings. When I first got sober, I was going to four step meetings a week. And what I finally discovered after going through the recovery process in the big book. That what was happening in these 12 and 12 meetings were, there were people that were sharing about the steps. There were people, people that were reading about the steps. There were people that were thinking about the steps. There were people that were going to these step meetings. But there wasn't anybody that was actually doing them. They weren't actually, they agreed with them in theory. They just weren't going out and making direct amends. You know, they, but they agreed to it in theory. I'd be in a meeting, and it'd be a ninth step meeting, and somebody would raise their hand, and they'd say like, I'm going to go through step nine formally, but I'm going to take the meeting hostage for the next seven minutes, sharing my opinion on what it would be like if I ever did. <laughs> you know, and you listen to this guy go on and on about how he apologized to his wife for, for sleeping with 35 people, and she didn't take it very well, you know, and, and that's his understanding of the ninth step. You know, and, and uh, you know, so so with the step book, listen, I love the step book. The step, the step book is probably the clearest perspective of the alcoholic personality and dilemma that's ever been published. Bill Wilson was unbelievably intuitive. But the step book isn't the textbook for recovery. It's a series of essays that brought and deepened the concepts of the steps. And so what happened was when the step, all these step meetings popped up, they allowed people to believe that they were working the steps by agreeing to them in theory rather than actually doing them. And those two things, what happened was, when I came into AA, if somebody didn't hand me a set of, of big book, you know, uh, eight cassette tapes that taught me about recovery, I would have died. Because I was at a point where meetings and service was not going to cut. I'm what's, I'm what's described in the book Alcoholics Anonymous as a real alcohol. The time and the place is going to come without a spiritual awakening without a complete rearrangement in my thought processes and in my behaviors, without that complete rearrangement, I would not stand a chance. And yet you would hear stuff shared in meetings like, I don't know how it works. It just works. You idiot, we just wrote read how it works. Are you crazy? You don't know how it works. I bet you don't know how it works. <laughs> or, you know, I keep it simple. I bet you keep it simple. That doesn't surprise me at all that you keep it simple. Oh my God! Now I started. Started. I, listen, I was trying to be as humble as possible, if you can imagine such a thing, when I started to sponsor these guys back in the day. But I started taking them through the steps. I started to, to cause some trouble in our area. What the hell is Chris doing? You know what? With his newfangled AA that he's got going, newfangled AA. It's a book. It's 1939. I'm using. <laughs> You know, and we started to cause a little trouble. Like we became those guys at that meeting over there. You know what I mean? And, uh, but I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Over the years, guess guess whose meeting they sent their kids to when their kids were in trouble. You know what I'm saying? They sent them over to us fanatics because they saw the success. People that weren't staying sober, they were relapsing day after week after month after year would get involved with us and they'd get sober. And all of a sudden, their lives would start to be start to get put back together. And people are like, what the hell happened? You know, I guess he got honest. No, he didn't get honest. He, you know, he started to work a program of recovery. The biggest lie in AA is when somebody walks in who's been a relapser, uh, he must just not want it, or he's not being honest. Oh, oh my God, how about it's your fault for not offering them the program of recovery, you moron? Because all you want to do is share. <laughs> you know, you self-centered moron. How about it's your fault that that guy is relapsing? How about looking at it like that? 
You know, because that's more the truth. There's two reasons why we die. One of them is we don't buy the message. We don't buy it. And I can understand that. Bill Wilson said there are those who cannot or will not. He was very non-judgmental, unlike me. <laughs> and then the other reason that we die is no one offers us a solution with depth and weight. No one offers us enough of a solution to be able to really solve it, solve the problem, because we're in real trouble. We're not the disco drunk that just needs a little encouragement and they'll be able to stay sober. We're alcoholic, you know? And I, and so things started to change. Now, what I see happening down the whole coast of New Jersey, which I'm really excited about, is meetings are popping up almost on a monthly basis that are solution literature-based meetings. It's exciting to me because there are going to be people whose lives are going to get saved. Not only their lives are going to get saved, but the quality of their life is going to be put back into it. They're going to be able to live out the potential that people used to threaten us that we had. We'll actually have it now because we'll be part of this recovery process. I'm really, really excited about that. And there's a renaissance going on in Alcoholics Anonymous today. And what you'll see is the, the pendulum swung way too far to the fellowship side for a long decades, for a long, long time. Now it's trying to swing back over to the recovery side. I think it's going to balance out. I think it's going to balance out where in an area you're going to have solution literature-based meetings and you're going to have the sharing meetings because I don't want those people in my big book meetings anyway. You know, you're going to need both types of meetings. And, uh, and I, you know, I think it's going to be healthier. And I, I, think that, uh, I think that more of us will survive. Alcoholism survivability is going to increase. Now, alcoholism is unorthodox. Recovery is unorthodox, too. The recovery from, from alcoholism comes from uh, the spirit. It comes from our connectivity to God as we understand God. And there's a lot of language in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and it always is pointing us toward God, pointing us toward God, pointing us toward God. And I think that's very, very important. The consciousness of the presence of God in my life today is the most important thing that I have. On a moment-by-moment -moment basis, I know that the Creator is with me, working through me sometimes. Sometimes my self-centeredness is, is in control. But the consciousness of the presence of God is part of, part of my operational methodology today. The comfort that you get from something like that. The power, the ability to be productive that you get from something like that is unmatched. It is truly unmatched. We are very fortunate, not that we have alcoholism, because that's a progressively fatal illness. It's not good news when they tell you you're an alcoholic, believe it or not, uh, because your chances are less than average. But the, the thing that we, we should be grateful for is the recovery process from this illness brings about such incredible changes in us. There's hundreds of promises in the big book. Some of them are incredible. You know, one of the, one of the promises that jumped out at me a couple of years ago that I had been missing was uh, that the quality of my life is going to get better every day. You know, as, as I grow... Spiritually, my life is going to become more valuable and more uh, more fun to live. You know, what I could have planned myself is nothing compared to what uh, what God can lay out for me. I'm really, really grateful to be here. I can't wait to hear uh, the rest of the speakers. You know, hold on to your seats. Every one of them is awesome. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, letting me share. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.